Gospel of Mark this morning. It's Mark chapter 10, verse 17. As Jesus started on His way, a man ran up to Him and fell on his knees before Him. Good teacher, He asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? May God add His blessing to the reading of the one verse in Mark here this morning. Amen. Golf is a great game. It's a game that's played outside in some of the most beautiful places uh, on the earth. It's a social game. It's an event. But with all that golf has to offer, it's a very difficult game to master. Um, it takes a lot of time. It takes money, uh, sometimes lessons. For sure, it takes a lot of practice. Uh, maybe it takes, more than anything else, a lot of patience um, to become a good golfer. And golf is so popular, they even came up with this really original name for a channel that golf is on 24 hours a day called the Golf Channel. How long did it take to come up with that? And I think Ray Goodman, who is our resident golf professional, uh, would back me up in this next statement. That the question golfers ask more than any other question is, what am I doing wrong? What am I doing wrong? I practice and I play and I still end up in the weeds, the sand trap, or the water. And most of us, most of us don't like criticism, but the greatest group of masochists in the world are golfers. <laughs> golfers seek criticism. They're always asking for what they're doing wrong. And, and usually here's the answer they get. Well, it's not what you're doing wrong. It's what you're not doing right. That's the problem. And then instruction is given to help get them back to have a straight shot or the right putt or the best chip. So when we ask questions, when we're looking for solutions of problems, we typically do the, you know, what, when, why, where, how, etc., etc. And the person we're looking at today, this person that runs up to Jesus, who comes face to face with Jesus, who has this encounter with Jesus, probably asked the single most important question that anyone could ask. Think about it. If you have the opportunity, you're face to face with Christ, you have this opportunity to ask Him one question that can impact you for the rest of your life, what would it be? This man, this man knew exactly what he was going to ask Jesus. He had one question. He hurries and presses through the crowd and he hits his knees in front of Jesus. And he flatters Jesus. He's enthusiastic to be there. He flatters Jesus, and then he asks them the question. Good teacher, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? There's his question. That may be the ultimate question. I mean, could he ask another question that would be any greater than that? Than that? That's the ultimate question. It's not about improving oneself it's not making our golf score better. How can I be a better father, husband, employee? No, the question is, what must I do to inherit eternal life? So the first part, what must or what shall I do? <coughs> this man was looking for the kingdom of heaven. He was looking for how can he spend time in the kingdom of heaven. What must I do? What, what are the requirements? What do I have to do for that to happen? What is required of me? What boxes do I have to check to make sure that I can have eternal life? He doesn't ask Jesus, what does Jesus have to do? He doesn't ask what God has to do, what has to be present. He doesn't ask, what, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? So what do I have to do as a human being? Well, let, let's not just focus on the rich young ruler today. Let's let the rich young ruler represent all of us. That we are the ones that are pressing through the crowd, that are going up to Jesus. We have this opportunity and we've asked him, what must we do to inherit eternal life? We've asked the ultimate question. And that's where we started today in our text. And he starts with, good teacher, what must I do? 
It says here he's eager. Uh, his outward appearance, he seems to be seeking. Some would say he was very educated. Some even, some scholars believe he was a, a lawyer. Uh, and he was pressing to get the answer to this question. But he also is a man of great wealth. And great social standing. So maybe we would say, well, he humbled himself. He fell on his knees. He humbled himself before Jesus to ask this question. So we might say, well, yeah, he's a man of great humility also. And on the surface, it looks like that. That he has humbled himself before God. He wants to know the answer to the question. He's just like one of us. And then Jesus, as he typically does, always answers questions indirectly. When a question gets asked of Jesus, he always takes it to a teaching moment and never answers directly. He answers indirectly, indirectly, and here's what he says in verse 18. Why do you call me good? Now, the, the man falls on his knees before Jesus says, good teacher. Ask the question, and Jesus right out says, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. So is Jesus evading the question? Well, it helps here to understand Greek. No, I don't. But I can research it and sound like I did. So just know that I, I don't know this Greek stuff like scholars do. But what I do, you know, what I found out is for good there, there are two Greek words for good. There is a good that means just an external good. He's a good guy. I don't know him very well, but he seems like a good guy. Externally, he seems good. But then there's another word for good in the Greek that means intrinsically good. Intrinsically good. So that means he is, he is good inside and out. He is a good person. Now, which is Jesus? Is he externally good or is he intrinsically good? Well, we know him to be intrinsically good. But the good here that, that this man is saying, the Greek word there is externally good. Good teacher, externally good, good guy. What must I do with him? And so Jesus goes right back to him and says, why do you call me good? Because Jesus knows the word he used. You're just calling me good because people like my teachings. You don't know who I am. And so he lets him uh, in on some things to see if the fellow will actually identify who Jesus is more than a good teacher. There is only one who is good, and that is God. Now, the man could have said, Oh, but you are the Son of God. That's why you're good. But he doesn't say that. He doesn't even go into that. He sees Jesus as externally good. A good man is just trying to flatter you because I want you to answer my question. So good teacher. Good God. Well, what must I do? Because you are a, a good teacher. You are, maybe even you're a prophet. He doesn't know that this is the Son of Man. He doesn't know that this person that he's face to face with is Jesus Christ, God incarnate. He doesn't know that. And the reason he doesn't know that is because good translated here is externally good. And he never identifies himself as saying, oh no, you are good because you are the Son of God. Yet, Jesus lays it out there for him to do it. Now, some of us, especially today, maybe not in this age group, but a lot of us get very offended very easily if I was to tell you, none of you are good. None of, none of you are any good. I'm not good. None of you are good. We're not good. Who is good? God is good. But if we go out there and preach and tell you that you're not good, you might be offended. I can tell you the younger generation is offended when you tell them they're not good. Why? Because we live in a very... Uh, our strongest um, form of life today that we live under is humanism. Everybody's good. We are all good. In fact, you're so good, you get a ribbon just for showing up. That's a good one. We have gotten it so, we, we've made it so bad on our young people, when they breathe correctly, we give them a treat. Everybody's good. Because humanism has taken over. We think humanism, people being good, 
is all we need, and that's more important than the divine. So when we say, you're not good, that's what's meant. It's meant that as a human, we are not good. We are only good when we acknowledge the divine in our lives, because the only thing that is good that's inside of us is God. God is good. And so that's where this man maybe has a little trouble, his philosophy of humanism. And then we backed it up with Paul. In, Paul, in Romans chapter 3, verse 10, what does he say? Not one of you is righteous. No, not one. None of us. We feel pretty good sometimes, don't we? Don't we feel pretty good sometimes? Come on. I feel pretty good sometimes. Then, then I look in the mirror and say, eh, I wasn't very good. But sometimes you do feel good about yourself. What you've done, how you've helped somebody. Um, um, what, you know, just all the things that we try to do right. We, we feel good about ourselves. But the only thing that's good in us is, is God. That's where this man is. So there's a collision between humanism, human performance, that philosophy, and then what is spoken by Christ. The only one that's good is God. Well... I hope you don't leave here saying, you know, being offended. It's not that you're not good because you have God inside of you and what is good in you is the part that, that God plays out. That's the good part. That's where you are good. We're not good. God is good. But the rich young ruler, good teacher, what must I do? So how do we even determine good? What moral standard do we use to determine good? Well, each other. Good compared to him. Not so good compared to her. But I'm pretty good compared to him. So we have some moral standard, which is usually each other. And what else do we do? We grade ourselves on a curve. Of course we do. Well, I really didn't mean to do that, though. I, mean, I did pretty good today. I, didn't, you know, I had that thought, but come on. So we're good. We're, we, we deem ourselves good just because, of, come on, I'm a good guy. But God compares us how? How does he compare our goodness to the character of himself? Now are we good? Are we good? No amens on that. John Calvin said, when we keep our eyes on the horizontal level, the fixed plane, the earthly plane, we begin to think of ourselves more highly than we ought. We begin to flatter ourselves, consider ourselves just a little less than the demagogues until we turn our gaze to heaven and contemplate for a single second what kind of being God is. If we do that, then our self-image is shattered and we realize if we examine ourselves in the light of the character of God, we must repent, probably repent in dust and ashes. God is good. We are not. So Jesus gets past this, why do you call me good? Don't you know that only God is good? Because Jesus is talking about his own character. And he understands the rich young ruler has no idea who he is speaking to. He doesn't know he's face to face with God incarnate. He doesn't know he's talking to a sinless teacher. He knows he's just talking to a good teacher. That's by his own evaluation. So Jesus is challenging the man's assumption of goodness. Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus answers the question then, verse 19, you know the commandments, and now Jesus goes to the second tier of the commandments. You know the commandments. Do not steal. Do not give false testimony. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. What must I do right there in eternal life? Well, keep the commandments. And then he goes to the second tier commandments. Anything strange about that answer? The strange thing about that answer, first of all, is the last thing Jesus would tell you, the way to eternal life is by keeping the law. Jesus was not about the law, was he? He came to fulfill the law. And the law took on new meaning when he came. And so by him saying, well, don't steal, don't murder, honor your father and mother, don't fraud, it seems really odd. So 
Why does he say that? It seems strange. Well, you rich young ruler, you know the law. And then he goes, he goes back in and he talks about the law. And the rich young ruler has an answer. I mean, you could see, I, I'll bet you his face went, Teacher, verse 20, all these I have kept since a boy. I haven't killed anybody. I haven't defrauded anybody. I've honored my mother and father. Whoo! Come in. That's how he felt. But Jesus wasn't done. I can just imagine the massive sign of relief on the rich young ruler's face. See, he's trying to find the answer, but as he finds the answer, he thinks he's seeking, sinking deeper and deeper in quicksand. In the more he's, oh, I haven't murdered. I haven't stolen anything. Uh, I haven't defrauded anybody. I've honored my mother and father really almost all the time. And he says he's been doing it since he was a youth. So, Jesus then has more to tell him. This, this student who doesn't know, he, he says, uh, fellow, you probably weren't at the Sermon on the Mount. He doesn't say that in here. Jesus is thinking that. Editorial. You must not have been at the Sermon on the Mount because I explained the law to you at that time and you must have missed it. And I just put you to the test. Maybe you haven't killed anybody. Uh, maybe you haven't hated your brother and sister. But have you ever hated somebody or just been angry unjustly at anyone? Oh, you don't steal? Have you ever been late paying a bill? Have you ever been late paying a bill? Because when you are late, that money belongs to your creditor. And so if you're not paying your creditor on time, you might as well be going into their house and taking money out of their wallet. Because you're stealing. Ever been late for work? Ever left work early without having approval? You're stealing. That's what Jesus is saying. If you're going to act like you haven't stolen, maybe you need to take a look a little deeper into your life. The rich young ruler didn't get it. Because Jesus didn't speak to him that way. Jesus tells us that the law is greater than just the Ten Commandments. Maybe we would have spoken to the rich young ruler that way. Hey, look here, fellow. You think you've kept them from your youth? Let me tell you something. You ever been laid on, on a bill? You ever been angry unjustly at somebody? But Jesus doesn't do that. Jesus looked at him, verse 21. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said. One thing you lack. So if you think you've kept all the commandments, let's see... Let's see if that first commandment is one that you are failing on. Are you putting anything before me? Let's test you. So he looks at the man and loves him and says, You lack one thing. Go and sell everything you have and give it to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. And now we can feel sad for the man because we know that he has valued his treasure. He has valued those things that he thinks he has earned and he has put away. Verse 22. At this the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Now the lesson on that day and the lesson for us today is that this man and us, we are lawbreakers. We are lawbreakers. And there's no way he or anyone else that has broken a law can inherit the kingdom of God by standing on the law. Have any of you ever broken a commandment? No? None of you? I'm the only one? We've all broken the commandments by thought, word, or deed. And so if we're going to stand on the commandments to get into heaven, probably pretty empty. 
I'm not going to see my friends there. You're not going to see me there if I'm standing on the law. And that's why Jesus says, what are we to do? We're to put him first in everything. And so, my friend, the rich young ruler, I think you have something before me. Go and sell that, in, that which is before me. Go sell your small g God and give to the poor and then follow me. And then you will have eternal life. And he walks away sad because he knows he can't do that. See, he was appealing to a heroic life. Sell those things. Give it to the poor. Just keep what's essential for living, not more than that. And so we can't walk away from this like many times we do. Rich people can't get to heaven. They, that's why I don't want to be rich. Because I can't get to heaven if I'm rich. That's not what it says. Rich, there's plenty of rich people in heaven. And plenty of poor people in heaven. It's if you're putting something that you determine that makes you rich. Maybe not in wealth, but what you put ahead of God. That's what the rich young ruler is. We could be getting rich young rulers. I mean, think about where we live, what kind of house we live in, what kind of cars we drive, what kind of retirements we have. In many, many places, we would be very, very wealthy. And so if God came to you today and said, are you putting those things first or are you putting me first? Can you answer that question? Yes, you are first at all times. That's what he's saying. He's not saying if you're rich, you can't get to heaven. That's not what he says. Plenty of rich people in heaven. What he's saying is put me first. All the time. There could be no other gods in our life. Not that you can have a second God. Well, God, you're always first. And then, you know, football second. My golf is second. My job is second. Sometimes it's first. But usually it's second. Making sure my retirement account is growing is, well, it's not always first, but sometimes first. He has to be first always. Not sometimes. And there's no second. Well, what's your second? No, I don't have it. Everything I have is for God. If he asked me today to give this, I'm going to give it. If he asked for this, I'm going to do it. Why? Because I want to be with him eternally. That's the story of the rich young ruler. So our question then is, how do you walk away? Do you walk away saying, thank you Jesus, son of God, God incarnate. I am going to be inheriting eternal life with you because you are always first in my life. Or are you walking away sad? He is more than a good teacher. He is intrinsically good. He is always good. And the good in us is only revealed by the amount of Him that is inside of us that we allow to show. And so as we witness this week, let's witness as that ruler that came to Jesus, understanding that He was the Son of God, and that we are going to share an eternal life with Him because He is paramount in our lives. Amen. Almighty God, we thank You for this story today of the rich young ruler. We are thankful for what it means to us that we tend to think of ourselves not in the rich young ruler's shoes, but many times I have put You second. And so, Lord, I repent of that today and seek to put you first in everything in my life. And when those times get hard to do that, I call upon you to be with me, that the Spirit, the Holy Spirit would be with me to push away any of those things that I seek to put in front of you. And so, Lord, we ask that you would bless this congregation and bless the Sylvan Abbey community of faith, those that aren't here today that are part of this community, that they would continue to put you first. And as they put you first, you would bless them and this community and all that we would have to do for you in ministry here at 2817 Sunset Point Road. Amen. Our final hymn is number 593. Here I am, Lord.